Hi everyone. Today we'd like to spend some time talking a bit about Observational Astronomy Part 2. Uh, this is the second week of course content in Astro 322 and uh, today we'll be talking about filters, we'll be talking about angular coordinates, and we'll be talking a bit about telescope systems. So without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about why astronomical filters are so important. This is primarily something that comes up in optical astronomy, uh, though there are the notions of filters in other wave bands. Uh, the real reason it becomes important in optical astronomy is that the CCD cameras that we usually use for imaging are only sensitive to the number of photons. Essentially, as long as you put a uh, electron into the band gap of the silicon or whatever uh, semiconductor material it is, uh, it only counts one photon leading to uh, large, usually one electron. Uh, and then the way we actually control and make a detector color sensitive is to use the idea of a filter. And so a filter is a optical element that controls the amount of light that comes through as a function of wavelength. And uh, what this does is you sort of have what we call the band pass of a filter, sort of illustrated here. And this diagram here shows you what an optimal filter would look like. An optimal filter would have some sort of throughput as a function of wavelength, and between two wavelengths here, lambda 1 and lambda 2, uh, it would allow all of the light through, and then outside of that range, it would let none of that light through. And when we stick this filter into an optical element, what it does, or into an optical path of a detector, what it does is it takes the incident flux density of light, that's this F lambda, and it essentially multiplies by it. The throughput essentially says, okay, we are going to multiply that uh, function of flux density by the flux density uh, throughput of the filter. And what that practically does is it takes the observed flux density, which here is nominally an integral over zero to infinity. So this means all the wavelengths of light get detected by the detector. Not entirely true, but for our math, that's a great approximation. And then what we'll do is we uh, basically restrict it to this band, this lambda one to lambda lambda 2 band. Uh, and that's because the uh, filter is only allowing light through in that band. If we're outside of it, say less than lambda 1 or more than lambda 2, the integrand here will be multiplied out to be 0, so there's no contribution to the filter there. So essentially what the filter is doing is it's making a color blind detector, uh, kind of like me, to a color sensitive detector, uh, so it only knows a certain uh, color. Now this is an ideal filter set right here, uh, but in reality, filters are more complicated. These actual filters have some shape to them. And uh, what we see here are some classic filters used in optical astronomy. Uh, so on the horizontal axis of these plots, we see the wavelength of light uh, that's being received by a CCD camera. And on the vertical axis, there are uh, the throughputs. And I've written down two different standard sets of filters here. Uh, one of them is the filter set that is used on the Hubble Space Telescope, one of their primary survey cameras uses these filters. And then the other one is called the Bessel, or sometimes the Johnson Cousins filter set. Uh, and this one's a little bit older here. And so these filters show the throughput here of these systems. And they have these kind of funny names, like F336W or F814W. Uh, and for the Hubble filters, what this just means is a filter. And then this unit here is the approximate center wavelength of that filter in nanometers. So F336W is over here, and its sort of center of mass in this wavelength space right here comes in at about 336 nanometers. Similarly, their 814 filter over here goes over a much wider range uh, and it has a sort of center here at about 814 nanometers. Now, the actual shapes of the filters are pretty important. This isn't this nice sharp edge, flat top, drops down, 
uh, filter set. Instead, there's a bit of a shape to them. They almost look like little uh, ghosts uh, or something like that. They're uh, sort of have a ramp up and a ramp down. And this comes from the physical limitations in how we can manufacture these optical elements. Uh, these are interference filters that only allow certain wavelengths of light to transmit, uh, but the actual properties of that interference can lead to some uh, inhomogeneities and non-perfect ramp up and ramp down. Uh, sort of edges on the filter. So these are all just sort of standard names. I should talk about the Bessel names. These are fairly common, uh, U, B, V, R, and I. These are an older filter set, so stuff from the 70s, 80s, and 90s really relies here on these Bessel filters, and they're fairly common. Uh, they have a little bit more kind of nomenclature uh, associated with them, where U is sort of the ultraviolet, B is the blue, V is the visible, which is sort of a yellowish color uh, when it transmits, yellow-green light gets transmitted, R for red, and I for infrared. Uh, but there are other filter sets. In particular, I want to focus on uh, these filters, the Hubble and Bessel filters, uh, through the observational data in the course, but we'll also take great advantage of two additional filter sets. Uh, the first is from the Gaia satellite, and that has uh, three very broad bands covering the optical. They have a blue band, and then they have a red band indicated by BP and RP. And then most of the Gaia mission is going to collect data in this band that spans almost the entirety of the optical and a fair bit beyond uh, that is the G or kind of green or Gaia band. Uh, it's right in the middle. Uh, and you'll notice that the B and the R kind of cover the same range as the G filter, but just two separate halves kind of making a whole. Even so, there's some overlap between these filters. Uh, and then you can really see the optical structure of the Gaia filter. Uh, this is, you know, imperfections uh, in the material. This is the best the engineers could do. I mean, nobody wants this spike here. It's not by design. It's just that's the way that the filter has to be designed. And so we have to be aware of and calibrate that out. Uh, the SDSS filters are short for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, sometimes just called the Sloan filters, and those have letters like the Bessel letters of U-G-R-I-N-Z, or uh, the U-Grizz set, ultraviolet, G for green, R for red, I for infrared, and Z for even more than infrared. So this gives you a kind of a shape uh, here, and you'll notice that the throughputs are quite different. And uh, the Sloan filters, unlike a lot of the other filter sets, have very minimal overlap between them. So it's a fairly clean separation in the colors of light that get transmitted. So we'll be using uh, these filter sets as we go, just sort of you can refer back to here to see what they are uh, referencing uh, as we take a look at uh, different filters and different observational data sets. I also wanted to put this in context with a couple other filter sets. Uh, so here are the same Hubble filters that we were looking at, the F336, 438, 814, uh, are those filters. Uh, Hubble also has an infrared camera or an infrared channel to its survey camera uh, that give you uh, 1.1 and 1.6 micron light through. This is the sort of gray and the black curves illustrated here. Uh, you'll notice that uh, they this isn't 110 nanometers, this is 1.1 microns. Um, I guess sending digits to space is very expensive, so they had to keep these fairly uh, compact in their notation. Uh, eventually, uh, you get used to the trauma of the observational conventions. Uh, another important mission for us is the GALAX mission, or the Galaxy Evolution Explorer. Uh, and this is an ultraviolet mission, and we'll learn that ultraviolet light is really useful for tracing young high-mass stars. Uh, so these two bands, the far ultraviolet and the near ultraviolet bands, uh, show up 
uh, here in a lot of our studies. And then very recently, we've become quite a fan of the James Webb Space Telescope, also called the JWST data. And that has a bunch of filters that go out farther from where the Hubble telescope bands are. And so here's some characteristic bands here, 200, 300, 770, or 2100. Uh, here, uh, again, they're on the same kind of decimal place band as the infrared in the Hubble. Uh, so 200W is a wideband filter at two microns in, or two micrometers uh, in the JWST data sets. So this gives us the full sets of uh, colors that we'll be working with uh, and the filter set. Now, the reason why this shows up a lot is that we use the light in these two filters and we compare it. So this is a nice relative measure for the different detectors that we're using. And so when I say a color astronomically, that usually means something very specific. And it's a measurement of the flux density ratio on a, uh, between two different filters on a relative scale in the magnitude system. So when I look at something like G minus R, and this is minus two, and this would be the Sloan uh, values, the primes uh, only indicate a specific Sloan type of the Sloan filter set. They can be ignored for your purpose. Uh, and so this is a minus 2.5 log. And then this is the flux density integrated over the green band divided by the flux density integrated over the red band. Uh, and so this is 2.5 log 10 of these integrals and each of these uh, filter throughput terms here and here, those are there to restrict the bounds of the integral to the green filter and then the red filter respectively. So this just measures the relative flux density ratio between these two bands. So let's do an actual example of what a calculation looks like. It's just going to come out to be a number here. And so I've shown a couple of curves of stars here, and I'm going to use the Bessel filters, the B minus V color index of star A. And this is a nice hot star here. And then the B and the V bands, I'm approximating these as sort of the perfect transmission bands. We're really going to just do that in this class. We're not going to worry about actual filter shapes too, too much. So let's take a look at that in um, a uh, sort of, uh, yeah, in my diagram here. And so what I'm going to do here is I essentially need to, this is basically saying add up the ratio. Now let's go and draw this in black. Yeah, let's look at the bands in these kind of three regions here. And this gives us uh, kind of these two domains. And this is really just asking us to compare the integral in uh, this region here, which is this part. We want to compare the integral in that to the integral in this other region. And that's all the filter is doing. And we want to basically take 2.5 times the log of the areas of these two curves. And you can already see that the B part of the spectrum is going to have more area under the curve than the V part of the spectrum. So let's uh, clear that out and uh, resketch in our bounds here. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Oops, That's, that one's even worse than my usual terrible handwriting will tolerate. There we go. Okay, uh, so what I want to do is just do kind of first year calculus approximations by dividing this band up into a couple uh, kind of triangular air and rectangular areas. And I'm just going to calculate the areas of these parts. So in both cases, the base of our triangles or rectangles are going to be 100 nanometers. And this is a flux density in unknown units, so I'm not going to worry too much about the actual values. Everything is a ratio, so it's all going to cancel out in our, um, so we don't have to worry about it too much. And if we look at this, we can see that, uh, let's zoom on in here, and we can see that this goes from about 0 0.6 to up to, eh, let's call it uh, 1.1. So this means that this side of the triangle here has and it's length of 0 0.5, and then that's 100, and then this part here 
is 0 0.6. Uh, so that gives us our expression. So this is going to be about 60. And this is a half base times height. So 0 0.5 times 100 would be 50 times 2 is 25. So that gives me kind of those two areas there in some sort of flux density units. Uh, let's come down here and do this for the V-band section. There's another little triangle, 0.4 to 0.6. That's 0.2 on that length. This one's also 100. So that means that this little unit has an area of 10. And then that is uh, a height of uh, 40. So now we just add up our two parts. Uh, this part has an integral of 85. This part has an integral of 50. And so we can come back and then use that to calculate the filter. So the B minus V color is going to be minus 2.5 log 10 of 85 over the 50. And so 85 was the integral in the B part, and 50 was the integral approximation in the v part and so if i carry out that math um i get an answer of about oops let's not do that an integral answer of about minus 0 0.6 so that says that the b minus v color of the star is minus 0 0.6 this can be a little confusing at times because it's just a number. And often you'll see these axes plotted as, okay, here's a bunch of colors of stars and it runs from minus one to two or something like that. In which case we have to sort of always have in our mind what that means. And just pay a little bit of attention to this, uh, cur this uh, expression here. So if we go back uh, here to our integral, if we think about what happens inside this integral, if the top term is larger than the bottom term, that means it dominates it. So it is more green than red. Or in our example, this curve is more blue than it is what visible or V-band. Uh, and in that case, this will, be a, uh, this will be a number larger than 1, therefore my log 10 of that number will be bigger than 0, and then I multiply that by minus 2.5. So a negative sign here is going to indicate that this is a green color. So on average, whenever I see this construction of a G minus R uh, shown here, or a B minus V, or something like that. Whenever I have a negative number or a small, relatively small number, that means that the term, the color band on the left will dominate. So in our case, a negative 0.6 indicates that there was more B than there was V. Similarly, a positive number would indicate that the visible band dominates. And so uh, that would show that there's more light in the V band. So whenever you're looking at the axes on a curve, if you see stuff that's a negative value on the left side of that axis, that indicates that the color term on the left of the color index is what's important. We'll see this a lot when we deal with Hertzsprung Russell diagrams. Okay, so moving on, the next thing that we want to look at is the angles uh, to on me measured on the sky. So this is going to show us where the light is coming from instead of how much light we are getting. We measure the light on uh, the sky using the notion of angles. Uh, so the directions that we're measuring really here are only measured in references or distances in units of angles. And the reason that we have to measure in angles is we're stuck here on Earth, and the only thing we know is the direction to objects. Without information about the distances to the objects, all we can tell is the directions that we are going in. And so as an example, what we can do is we have over here a diagram where we can measure the direction to one star, say the blue star, and the other star, the red star, and then the angle between them is the angle between the two rays pointing off towards those stars. Similarly, we can also measure the angular size of an object as the angle between 
two rays going out and touching the opposite sides of that object, like this poorly drawn little galaxy right down here. In astronomy, we like to use the notion of sexagesimal units, and sexagesimal just means base 60. Uh, you're probably familiar with a lot of these from geometry or school uh, or time. Uh, and that is, uh, so one degree is divided into 60 arc minutes, and each arc minute is divided into an arc seconds. So there are 3,600 arc seconds in a degree. And we measure or set up a coordinate system on the sky using, uh, the, uh, using a sphere. And that's because we're stuck here on Earth and we're looking out in all directions. And uh, we essentially have a spherical sky around us. So we develop this concept. It's not a real thing. It's a conceptual notion of a celestial sphere. And then we uh, write down a longitude-like and latitude-like coordinate system on top of that. And the way we construct our celestial sphere is to think about a um, sphere of uniform distance that is far away, uh, but and then everything in the sky is projected to land on that celestial sphere. And then the Earth rotates within it. So this is just a construct that we set up in order to make a meaningful, sensible coordinate system, which we then write down latitude-like and longitude-like coordinates on them. And those coordinates are called the right ascension for the longitude and then the declination for the latitude. And we have a nice little picture here showing the Earth rotating within the celestial sphere. Thanks a lot, Wikipedia. You're the boss. Anyways, the celestial sphere that we see here has some parts, and we'll often talk about the poles. So that's analogous to the North Pole and South Pole on Earth. These are the North and South celestial poles. And you can actually find them by taking the rotation of the Earth and going at the North Pole and shooting a line from the center of the Earth through the North Pole on out to where it hits our uh, mystical construct of the North Celestial Sphere, and that gives us where the North Celestial Pole is. And the South Celestial Pole is down here, and shockingly, the line around the equator is called the Celestial Equator. And so then we set up these lines of right ascension and declination to describe coordinates of objects on the Celestial Sphere. But there's a wrinkle, and the wrinkle is shown right here on the screen. Uh, it is illustrating that the Earth is rotating. And so this is a time-varying coordinate system with respect to Earth. We can't just have everything fixed with us. Our position under the sky rotates. Newsflash, right? You know, the sun rises and set. The best thing I learned in university. Anyways, what you're actually seeing here is that the uh, this means that we actually have to make a reference between the coordinates on the sky and the coordinates on the ground. It's not a perfect relationship, but they are connected to each other. Now, uh, so that's one thing to notice. And then the other thing to notice is much like the lines of longitude on the Earth, the lines of right ascension on the celestial sphere are not equally spaced. They converge at the poles. So if you stand at the North Pole of the Earth, you can go through 360 degrees of uh, uh, longitude by putting your hand on the pole. It's sort of red and white striped in my perfection, in my mental vision, kind of like a you know, candy cane. And then you run around it and you know you know take a couple seconds to run around it and you've gone through 360 degrees of uh, longitude carrying out the same feature on the equator of the earth would take much much more time and you'd have to run all the way around the equator of the earth which would take i don't know a substantial amount of time and probably swimming as well uh, so the the important thing here is that the lines of right ascension converge at the poles of the planet uh, or and at, or at the poles of the celestial sphere, just like the lines of longitude converge at the poles of the planet. So this has a uh, feature when we look at astronomical maps, like here's an actual astronomical map that I just was doing research one day and I said, I should screen capture this for my class. And this shows uh, observations mapped out in a right ascension and declination space. And you'll notice that this has units uh, written here. Uh, and these are 0, 20, and 0. 
And then the declination is 5900, 5950, 5910, etc. The declination units are given in degrees, minutes, and seconds. 59 degrees, 0 minutes, 0 seconds. 59 degrees, 5 minutes, 0 seconds. 59 degrees, 20 minutes, 0 seconds. And so there's distance is, uh, in between these, and those are the intervals of latitude. Remember that lines of latitude are equally spaced in kind of distance in units on the celestial sphere, but the lines of right ascension are not. This brings us to our final wrinkle, uh, or really it's the first wrinkle about right ascension, which is it is a rotating coordinate system, and one rotation of the Earth with respect to the celestial coordinate system leads us to one day of time. Technically, that's what's called a sidereal day, and what you think of as a 24-hour day is a solar day. Uh, so the sidereal day is the day measured with respect to the stars and is four minutes shorter than the solar day. But the odd consequences of this is that the right ascension units are usually measured in units of time not in units of degrees. And so there are 24 hours in a sidereal day, and then we divide up the right ascension axis into hours, minutes, and seconds, and not degrees, arc minutes, and arc seconds. And so this is actually a measure of zero hours, 20 minutes of sidereal time, and zero seconds of sidereal time. Practically, all this means for you is that when you have an axis that is measured in hours, minutes, and seconds, what you need to do is multiply by 15, that's the 360 divided by 24, to turn that into units of degrees or sometimes decimal degrees. Uh, so that gives you uh, some uh, variation here. The other thing that you need to look at when you're looking at a uh, plot like this is that you need to measure any sort of scale references or distances are measured with respect to the declination or the latitude axis. That's the one that's equally spaced. And so if I wanted to measure this distance here, I, you know, sort of the size of whatever this little object is in uh, space, I would want to reference it to the vertical axis and say the distance from here to here is five arc minutes. If I measure from here to here, which is one minute of time, not only do I have to worry about it, it's a minute of time, I also have to care about what declination I am at. And that's because of this convergence of the lines of longitude. So it's just much easier to always reference to the declination axis. You can use the right ascension and put in the cosine declination term that allows it to be corrected to the right size. But it's generally easier just to say, measure your scale bar off of the vertical axis. <clears throat> The next thing to talk about is this concept of projected distances. So we've got a full coordinate system, and then if we want to measure the sizes or intervals on that, we want to uh, measure the sizes of objects. And we almost always do this using the small angle formula. So we think about this uh, distance out here to the object D and making a triangle with the extent of the physical object here, S. And then we say that this should really be something like s is equal to d cosine or d tangent theta or something. But that's very approximately equal to theta if theta is much, much less than 1 and measured in units of radians. So we can get rid of all the trig if these two stipulations are true. Angle less than 1 radians and expressed in radians. So then we can actually just measure the size of this object in terms of the distance and the angle. And this sounds really kind of, well, okay, abstract. It's actually pretty useful to go through the exercise of doing it. Uh, this is a star forming region in a nearby galaxy. And I've put it here onto a scale and I want to measure how big this region actually is. It's measure, it's in the galaxy M33. You'll hear that name a lot in my class, best galaxy. Um, and I want to measure how big this region is. So I can do that by characterizing the, the diameter of this circle right here. So I want to measure the diameter of this circle. So I could measure it either direction, 
But the rule that I just laid down is that I want to reference it to the latitude-like axis, which is the declination. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to measure this line over to the deck axis there. I'm going to measure the bottom over to the deck axis here. Okay, uh, that's good. And so that's the actual diameter there. And then I go in to the axis over here and measure what the actual extent is. And you'll notice we have a little bit of trickiness. This is in units of arc seconds. So 4630, 4640, sorry, 46 arcs minutes, 30 arc seconds, 40 arc seconds, 50 arc seconds. And so I'm measuring from 45 arc seconds to the zero uh, arc seconds where the arc minute ticks over to uh, 47. And then I go here from zero up to 18 arc seconds here. So, oh, sorry, this is 45 to zero. Uh, this interval here is going to be 15 arc seconds. And then this interval here will be the aforementioned 18 arc seconds. So I want to add up the 15 and the 18. And if I do that, I end up with shockingly 33 arc seconds. So that's the angular diameter of this object. I take two rays, I send one out to the top, and I send one out to the bottom, and I measure the angle between them, 33 seconds of arc. Now I want to use the projected distance formula, which is s is equal to d theta, to find out the size of this object, the actual physical extent of it inside the galaxy. But 33 arc seconds is not a radian, so I have to do uh, one arc minute is 60 arc seconds, then I know that one degree is uh, 60 arc minutes, then I know that, um, let's see here, we know that two pi radians is 360 degrees, and this can be very uh, 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 usefully expressed, I happen to know by heart, uh, that this is that uh, one radian is 206,265 arc seconds. 206,265. Useful number to have in your head. Uh, not critical, because you can always rederive it. Uh, so we multiply all that out, and that will give me an angle in radians. Uh, and then from there, I can turn that into an arc length. So let's say we say that the arc is the angle now in radians. And I multiply by the distance, which is 8.59 times 10 to the fifth parsecs. So 859 kiloparsecs is 8.59 times 10 to the fifth parsecs. And I grind all of that out and I get an answer of 140 parsecs. So that means that this physical object here has a physical extent of 140 parsecs. So very useful to actually know the distance to the object and the ability to read off sizes on the scale to figure out how physically large these objects are. Okay, so that's the key parts about um, the right ascension and declination coordinate system. Uh, we use another coordinate system in our uh, class a lot, which is called the galactic coordinate system. This is much more like latitude and longitude on Earth, but it's set up in a frame of reference uh, sort of oriented with the galaxy. And so these are usually measured in degrees. You don't have to worry about degree, minute, seconds, or any of that. It's almost always just written as 59.287 degrees galactic longitude minus 0 0.344 degrees galactic latitude. Much better coordinate system for a lot of what we're doing because um, we don't have to use it to steer telescopes. Right ascension and declination was built to steer telescopes. Galactic and longitude and latitude were built to find things in the galaxy. Anyways, uh, so if we envision where we are here in our galaxy, here's a little picture that says sun right there. And then uh, what we do is we say that we are in a uh, system where the direction towards the galactic center is called the galactic longitude equals zero line. And then we proceed looking down all, from north galactic pole, uh, we uh, sort of moving around, uh, what would that be, counterclockwise from that. Uh, it goes zero to 90 degrees. 180 is toward the galactic anti-center, 
270, then it comes back to the center. So zero is defined as the longitude measured towards the uh, galactic center. And then if we drop into the plane of the galaxy and look towards the galaxy, this is a top-down cartoon view of the galaxy, but this is what we actually see when we're sitting where we are in the sun. Uh, what we see here is that this is the galactic equator, and then the galactic center is this bright thing right here at the center. Galactic longitude, uh, me, sorry, longitude increases going to the left in this system. And then galactic latitude increases going up towards what's called the North Galactic Pole. Now, you might wonder what defines up versus down in the uh, galactic uh, coordinate system. And the answer is, is that we've defined the up to be such that our velocity vector and orbital motion is carrying us towards L equals 90. So we're moving around the galactic center clockwise. Uh, in this diagram. So somebody had to make a choice. They chose that the uh, 90 was uh, in the direction of our motion instead of opposite the direction of our motion. Uh, one thing that I should notice is that um, if you're looking at these coordinate systems, uh, they are a little bit weird because the right ascension declination and the longitude latitude systems all have their longitude coordinate increasing to the left. And if you have done like any math whatsoever in your life, you're used to the galactic or, or using used to the x-axis coordinate increasing to the right and then the y-axis coordinate going up. The reason why we're stuck with these so-called backwards coordinate systems is that we are not outside the celestial sphere, but we're inside looking out. So if we were on the surface of the celestial sphere, it would be a perfectly sensible, well-oriented, right-handed coordinate system. But astronomical coordinate systems are left-handed by construction because we're inside the sphere looking out instead of, you know, the sort of normal mathematical geometry. Uh, sorry, we're, we don't live in space yet. Okay. Next thing to talk about is parallax. Um, parallax is a cool technique that we use to measure the distances to uh, nearby objects. It is the foundation of our sense of how large the universe is. Everything is measured with respect to parallax motions. And the parallax arises because of our orbital motion around the sun. And this diagram here illustrates the basic construction of that diagram. Uh, and so what we have is we have our planet Earth here orbiting around the sun. You can tell it's the sun because it's relatively happy as a star goes. And we're looking out at a star, in this case, above the, galact uh, above the orbital plane of the Earth. And this constructs kind of two perspectives on the stars at different times of the year. Uh, six months later, we see it projected into the sky over here. And then uh, at our original observations, projected over here. So this sets up a nice triangle uh, measured here, where the base of the triangle is one astronomical unit. The height of the triangle is the distance to the star. And then we define the parallax angle to be the angle from the line to the sun relative to the line to the Earth. So this is the angle here. This is exaggerated for clarity. And so it causes the star to appear to move with respect to background objects. Now, the background objects in question were originally just more distant stars, but as time has gone on, we've been able to measure parallax to progressively farther and farther stars. So what we use now as our background coordinate system is a set of supermassive, luminous, uh, accreting black holes halfway across the universe, which establishes essentially a coordinate system that we really are not measuring the parallax to anytime soon. Uh, so that uh, gives us a fixed coordinate system to define our background objects, and then we measure the motion of stars with respect to that. Okay, so that's the conceptual setup. Let's talk a little bit through the math. 
Uh, if you just write down the um, trig of this equation, you can say that the tangent of this angle P is the opposite, 1 AU, over the adjacent uh, side, which is D. And so the tangent of the parallax is 1 AU over D. And I can rearrange this a little bit to find the distance. And then I will once again invoke the uh, the, I will invoke the relationship that a small angle uh, argument to tangent is just equal to that argument. So if this is radians and small, I get to this value. So this essentially says that uh, the distance is one astronomical unit over the parallax angle measured in, uh, measured in radians. I will usually be measuring the parallax angle in arc seconds. And so what we have done is to actually measure this, uh, we've invented a distance unit called a parsec, which essentially says the parallax of a star with a distance of one parsec equals one arc second. And the uh, actual physical unit here is the astronomical unit. And then the uh, size of a parsec is equal to the number of arc seconds in a radian times the size of an AU. So it's that 206265 times an astronomical unit, which is 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters. And that gives us our fundamental distance unit we'll use in this class, which is one parsec. You'll also hear about a light year, which is the distance that light travels in one year. And so we won't use that as much in this class. Uh, parsecs tend to be the astronomical distance unit of choice. <clears throat> so the parallax is not the only reason why stars appear to move over the course of the year. Stars are actually moving with respect to the galaxy and the celestial sphere. So we are surrounded by a bunch of nearby stars, and we are all part of this big stellar, almost fluid, that is sort of flowing around the galaxy in orbit. And there's lots of little random motions that are bringing stars towards each other and away from each other. Some are moving faster, some are moving slower. And this causes stars to appear to move. And so we call this kind of motion the proper motion. It, respect, it reflects the real motion of a star traveling through space. Uh, so this is a picture of Barnard's star over uh, several years with respect to background stars. And you can see as it's going, it has a notoriously high proper motion of about 10 arc seconds a year, I think and it's moving uh, there with respect to the background stars. And you can see that they're largely fixed. Occasionally you'll see stars come in and disappear. Those reflect the different depths of the observations that were kind of constructed uh, here uh, to show you this. So this is uh, actual motion of stars. And what's really neat is we should be able to really study these motions of stars and as well as their parallaxes if we carefully measure the positions of stars. And so what we're going to do over the next sort of chunk of the class is figure out how to use these observations to measure the positions through parallax and coordinates, and then the motions of the stars, in uh, this case, through proper motion. So proper motion is real motion, and it is the change in the angular coordinates of a star on the celestial sphere over time. It tends to be one-dimensional di one uh, and sort of going in the same direction, whereas parallax is moving uh, back and forth because of the Earth's rotation. So we usually measure this in um, coordinates call, or in a variable that we call mu, which represents the proper motion. And it's usually measured in units of arc seconds per year. Uh, it is a vector because it's moving on the celestial sphere and it has units uh, or it, it is frequently written as the proper motion times the cosine of the declination to account for the convergence of the longitude lines or the right ascension lines uh, as one component of the vector. Then the other component of the vector is the declination proper motion. So this gives us uh, our two kind of components uh, of the motion projected onto the celestial sphere. And if we just work through some of our awful astronomical units, we find out that the actual speed in real speed kilometer per second units, which is kind of the characteristic scale of speeds for stars with respect to each other, 
uh, is 4.74. It's uh, just, the, just the number that comes out of the unit conversion. Distance to the star in a parsec. And then the size of the proper motion measured in, again, its characteristic size units, which is one arc second per year. And so that measures essentially how fast this star is moving perpendicular to our line of sight, which is on the celestial sphere. Now we'd like to know a little bit more about how to measure the parallel component of this velocity vector, which is the third dimension of the velocity vector as measured along the line of sight. And the way we do that is through the measurement of what's called the radial velocity measured here through the Doppler shift. And the way the Doppler shift works is we use the Doppler effect, which is the change in apparent wavelength of light due to the relative motion of a source and a, or a receiver. And we can then measure how fast that uh, object is moving if we know the rest wavelengths or rest frequencies uh, equivalently of a spectral feature and then um, the observed rest wavelength or rest frequency of that spectral feature. And so we take the observed minus the rest wavelength over the rest wavelength in the non-relativistic Doppler formula, and we can figure out this VR term. And so this is a spectrum showing some of the features that we could lock onto and compare those to their rest features. And we call this the radial velocity because it is the radial component if this were a spherical polar coordinate system, the radial vector would be pointing along the direction measured by the Doppler shift. Now, it also follows the convention as measured in the Doppler shift uh, or in the spherical polar coordinate system that if it's increasing radius, uh, that would be a positive radial velocity. And the Doppler formula is set up so that things that are increasing in that radius or distance from us are moving away from us and those have positive radial velocities. Negative radial velocities are moving towards us. Those are uh, sort of having shorter wavelengths or higher energies than their rest energies. And that corresponds to negative velocities and objects moving towards us. In uh, our field, we'll often refer to these as red shifts and blue shifts for uh, positive and negative radial velocities, uh, respectively. And that's because if a object is moving away from us, the lines shift towards the red side of the spectrum or the long wavelength side of the spectrum. Uh, and then if it's moving towards us, they move towards the blue side of the spectrum or uh, it becomes blue shifted. And even if you're outside the optical, this doesn't matter. It get, uh, it, you, even in the radio, you have red shifts if it's going towards a longer wavelength slash lower frequencies and blue shifts if the lines are shifted towards higher frequencies or shorter wavelengths. Okay. Uh, the last thing to talk about today is a little bit about telescopes. Uh, so we focused a lot on detectors, namely CCDs as these detectors of light and how we can characterize them. But all of those detectors are put at the focal points of a large optical system. And those optical systems have two main properties that are going to affect the observations. And this is most important for understanding what we miss when we observe. The imperfections of the optical system are what leads to the limitations of a lot of our astronomy. Those two limitations are the angular resolution of the telescope and the sensitivity of the telescope. And here I'm going to focus on kind of two representative types of telescopes. Uh, the first one is a large, sort of what you think of as a large optical or infrared telescope. This is an actual image of JWST. Uh, so this is an infrared telescope and it has a size here of its primary optical element called uh, a diameter here D. So this is the size of the optical element of this telescope. And uh, the other type of telescope here, this is a radio interferometer. This is the very large array in New Mexico, and it's comprised of these 27 individual telescopes 
radio telescopes, which are these single dishes, uh, and they're all wired up to operate as a single large optical element. And so for the purposes of what is the size of an optical element, it is the distance between the large, uh, the largest distance between an individual element of the array. So the size of the optical element sets the key property of the angular resolution. And this is a property of angular of the of diffraction and interference of the light waves. And uh, the sense of it is that the smallest angle that a telescope can resolve is equal to the wavelength of light that you're observing at divided by the size of the optical element that is focusing that light, the D. So for the JWST, this D is the full size of the uh, primary mirror of the telescope. So light comes in, it bounces off that, it goes up and it hits a mirror embedded in the secondary structure, and then gets focused down into this gap in the center of the telescope. So it's a nice complicated optical system, but the key part for resolution is this optical diameter of the primary element here, D. For the VLA, the angular resolution is set by the distance here, which is, uh, controls the size of the angle that a telescope can resolve. And then the wavelength of light, the infrared wavelength, has a much shorter wavelength than the radio light observed here by the VLA. And so this telescope is going to have intrinsically an advantage in resolution that is controlled by the short wavelength of the telescope. Angular resolution has very practical effects. So what this shows is the exact same image observed with three different angular resolutions. Uh, and so the general sense of it is that smaller angular resolutions are better because they can see finer details in the objects. So this shows a typical field of view for Hubble observing in the F475 band, so this would be about 475 nanometer light. And the individual points of light here are stars in a nearby galaxy, <clears throat> once again M33. And this is Hubble's native resolution here, 0.1 arc second, and you can see all of these individual stars uh, shown here in this field. If we observe the same with a ground-based telescope that has good properties and an angular resolution of 0.5 arc seconds, we notice that things blur out. In particular, you're no longer able to tell the difference between, say, this object here as one star and the same thing in the Hubble image as two stars. And then it gets even worse here at one arc second. So these ground-based telescopes are have much worse angular resolution. Now, you might be thinking a little bit, well, uh, Hubble is a fairly small optical telescope. It's actually only about two meters. And a lot of these ground-based telescopes are observing at 475 nanometers, and they're bigger, eight meter, 10 meter size primary mirrors. Why are their angular resolutions worse? Well, the answer to that is that all of this effect here in the optical is controlled by atmospheric blurring. Turbulence in the atmosphere basically acts like a bunch of turbulent little optical cells in the atmosphere that leads to the light getting sort of uh, bounced around as it tries to propagate through the atmosphere, uh, leading to uh, stellar twinkling. Uh, and therefore, you know, in the sense of twinkle, twinkle, little star. And so what that does is it blurs out the images here. So this is uh, the other primary effect that uh, controls uh, angular resolution in the optical portion of the In the radio portion, less twinkling, but you are fundamentally limited by the long wavelengths where you observe. The other thing that you have uh, for a telescope is its sensitivity. And the all else being equal, the thing that controls the sensitivity is the area of the collecting uh, of the primary optical elements. Now, for the uh, JWST, the area is simply basically the size of each of these hexagonal panels 
added up, which we can kind of approximate that as a circle. And so its area is pi d squared over 4. The radio telescopes do not have uh, all of this area filled in and collecting area. Instead, the only part of the telescope that's collecting light is the individual dishes here. And so the even though the size of the optical element is the distance between the arrays, the collecting area of this telescope is just the sum of all the sizes of the individual dishes, which is 27 pi d squared over 4, where little d is the diameter of a dish d. Uh, they're still pretty big dishes. They're 26 meter dishes across. And so, yeah, this ends up being much larger than the JWST collecting area, but it's just kind of distributed uh, over a wider area. So. The bigger your light bucket, the more sensitive your telescope. So these are the two main properties that we have to care about, the angular resolution and the sensitivity. And so if we see larger telescopes, they tend to be better for both reasons. They have bigger light collecting area and they have better angular resolution, all else being equal. So they will be able to carry out deeper studies of astronomy. Uh, or astronomical objects and be able to see farther into uh, the universe. And so this is why we're perpetually obsessed with building larger telescopes, uh, is that that is the fundamental technical innovation that allows us to see farther into space. All right, I think that's all we want to talk about today. Thanks for watching uh, and feel free to post any questions in the content quiz.